So as many of my coworkers would say, you know, a long story short, <clears throat> I'm a survivor in a world where every day is mundane operations. My name is Ben, an S3 leader with LinkedIn, and I'm here today to share with you my experiences, challenges, and knowledge gained over my tenure as an S3 leader. And through collaboration with a friend and trusted colleague who unfortunately couldn't be here today, David Henke, we've developed a set of 10 axioms, fundamental patterns which offer an effective strategy for dealing with the pair of incredible demands placed upon modern SRE teams, the need to support an impeccable uptime, and the need to both support and participate in an ever-accelerating software development cycle. Today, I'm not planning to talk about all the things we've done right. I'm actually planning to talk about a lot of my war stories. Because if you're anything like me, you probably learn an awful lot more from what went wrong rather than what went right. So sit back, relax, you know, feel free to groan, moan, cheer, laugh as I walk through these war stories. And hopefully, no one in the room will have to attend the School of Hard Knocks to learn something that, well, I've already paid the price for. The first axiom is every day is mundane operations. The name of the talk, as you might imagine, it's quite... Uh, yeah, you know, quite, quite important. Put simply, we live in a world where our services never sleep, whether we're counting the impressions we serve, processing credit card transactions, or just the hardware clock ticking by. Our services are constantly in a state of change, and with change comes failures, escalations, and sleepless nights spent firefighting. Fortunately for us, though, we don't need to stop change, because we couldn't even if we wanted to. Change doesn't all get created equal, and that is a fact we can exploit to great effect. Some changes obviously are quite huge. A bad, a bad code push goes out, LinkedIn.com shows a wiper page. That gets all the resources it needs, it gets an immediate fix, and we're back to business as usual. Or a major cloud service provider goes down and thousands of, of different uh, dependents upon that cloud start having trouble. Again, same deal, gets all the resources it needs and gets fixed as quickly as possible. But not all changes are that big. There are also very small changes that can add up over time to something equally messy. What about that code push you made on Friday right before lunch? You know the one I'm talking about. The one that uh, degraded site speed by a hundredth of a second on a particular route. Or that unit test you were working on and you made it so much more flexible, but now it's a half a percent more flaky. Little stuff like that adds up too. And whether or not you end up with one big root cause or you end up with something, a, a lot of really small stuff adding up. The key is to keep finding the most important, big, impactful, painful problems you can and taking them off the top of the queue. The, the trick with this one is that there's never going to be a situation where you solve all of the problems. That's not what we're in the business of, and that's not what you're here to do. What, but by continuing to prioritize these and continuing to be diligent about this, you can reduce the number of really impactful, really painful things down, and you can start eating your way towards the less impactful, more minor things. So enough lecturing. So let's talk about a really minor bug. Let's get into the first war story. And this is, the, probably, the, this is probably the most minor bug I can possibly describe. This, this bug is a, is a, was a result of a single argument change on a single line in a single config file. And the bug had a really low chance of occurring, in my opinion. It only had a 1% chance per day of manifesting per node running the affected software. Wait, come on. That sounds like a really minor bug, right? Well, OK, some people know where this is going already. So how many people out here, I mean, this is SREcon after all, how many people in the room are responsible for running a big distributed system? And your definition may vary. OK, we've got a fair number of people. So when it comes to bugs and your big distributed system, just ask any of these people here, the odds are never in your favor. A bug that has an infinitesimally small chance of occurring is not only going to affect your system more than once, it's going to do it at the worst possible time that you can imagine. So this has all been rather abstract up until this point, so let's make this much less abstract. There's a 1% chance of this bug occurring per day, per node, and the system that I was responsible for at the time had 70,000 nodes. <laughs> That's 700 nodes, or 700 instances of this bug occurring per day, for those doing the math. That's the upper end of what a large team can deal with, and I mean very large team can deal with, with a mechanical Turk. And it's within the realm of what you'd need automatic remediation or, well, any sort of automation really to keep a handle on. When the, but the software wasn't just any software. The software was SaltStack. And at LinkedIn, this is, no, this is an open source product, by the way. At LinkedIn, we use this 
as a part of our deployment, our uh, as a remote execution and our, our configuration strategies. And when the story begins, we received a couple of scattered reports. And by scattered, I mean three. We had three total reports, and who, know, who knew they'd lead into something bigger? But we got three reports of deployment failures in our early integration environment. Nothing new there, except these were user reported, and our error classifier had no idea what they were. So these were either fundamentally new things, or these were something else entirely, something we, weren't, something we hadn't solved before. We started investigating, obviously. You know, it's kind of our job. And over the next two days, we ended up investing more and more and more time into this, eventually cranking up to 12 and 18 hour days trying to deal with this thing. Because over those two days, it went from a few scattered deployment problems to 50% of all deployments in production failing. Big problem. And this should be horrifying for most people in the room. I heard a small gasp, I think, from back in this area. The, because not only can you not push out new code, not only are your product launches getting delayed, and of course the, everyone internally is annoyed with you, what's worse, you can't roll back. If you've got something bad in the wild, you're screwed. And of course, you know, over the first two days, we couldn't find anything that related to this. We couldn't find anything at all that would indicate to us what was causing this. No changes to the deployment system, no changes to salt, no changes to host configuration. But on the third day, we actually found something. Very minor change, as you might imagine. I already mentioned it. But it was a change we didn't know about. It was a tiny change made to a legacy system called ULL. And what ULL was was a very arcane system from a long time ago in LinkedIn's history whose only job in life was to bundle up a bunch of LinkedIn-specific Python libraries and distribute them in the form of a tarball to every host in the fleet and then extract it. The idea was for is a app software that predated our standard deployment system or our software packaging systems. Well, they had a way to use the standard libraries too. And the change, by the way, was incredibly benign. We had, is how many people in the audience are familiar with Kafka? Some people? Okay. So we had some Kafka nodes. They'd, they'd received an unexpected spike in traffic that divide our models. And we're in the process of, of uplifting Kafka capacity. Nothing unusual there. Well, Nothing unusual about uplifting Kafka capacity. Something unusual about the model being wrong. And you know, the idea was, well, these Kafka nodes are getting into I.O. contention with the tarball extraction. So we're just going to I.O. nice the tarball extraction because no one cares if the ULL tarball is a few hours old or a few minutes old. But we do care if the Kafka message or, mass, messages are more than a few minutes old. All the right intent. The problem starts when this change didn't get pushed to the Kafka nodes. This change got pushed to the entire fleet. So what this did was this exposed, they, this took a race condition that had existed since the very first version of our standard deployment system, and it flipped it on its head. Rather than winning almost all of the races you know, and losing one out of every 10,000 or so attempts at running a deployment, we were now losing more than one out of 100. And that by itself isn't that big of a deal. The problem with these things is bugs rarely go in and one by one. Usually they go in groups. And what this did was this took a race condition that was shielding us from a small family of bugs, and now we were losing all the time. So let me talk about the bug. So for this bug to actually occur, a deployment request had to go to a specific host. And while that deployment request was being processed, the tarball extraction had to also be in flight. Now, of course, taking longer than it previously did, because we ionized it. And it had to hit a secondary bug, which would cause the tarball not to extract into a new directory and then be moved into place, you know, minimizing the, the risk here, but instead to extract over top of the live files. Yeah. Fun fact, Python will happily import this file as a partially written module with no issues and throw no errors. And because the parent process did the imports, but the child is the one that tried to invoke those processes, the child would seg fault. Deployments are screwed. And because the parent process still held the corrupt module in memory, all subsequent deployments were also screwed and would stay screwed until we manually intervened to unload that module from memory. And of course, because we used lazy loading, you know, so we didn't import too many things as a too soon, it made getting the timestamps really hard for this change. At the end of it, we invested about 750 engineering hours in this thing. And that's, bear in mind, 750 engineering hours across six people and two weeks. Long, long days. Now, the good part about this, though, is this is a prime example of every day's mundane operations, because 
we found and fixed a bug that had existed for years, ever since the first version of our standard deployment system. And when we fixed it, an entire class of problem that had been annoying our engineers to some degree for years went away overnight. Life became better, not just better, materially better to the tune of 233 engineering hours every single day being saved, not dealing with deployment failures that resulted from this combination of bugs. A com as a, something that we had never noticed before because they were so infrequent, but they had a high chance of affecting our long running deployments, inflating the cost. So regardless of whether or not you have a large single failure at the root of your major site issue, or whether or not you have many small degradations adding up to make a, a giant swampy mess that needs to be dealt with, at the end of it, it's critical we be aware of all of our changes, even the ones we don't think that uh, think are going to affect us, because without a change set, you have a manhunt. You're busy combing through every possible file, every interaction, trying to figure out where this, where this stuff's coming from. But if you have a change set, then you've got a police lineup. And if you have good timestamps, we didn't, but if you have good timestamps, you only have a few suspects that are actually worth investigating. So the second axiom that deals with the truth of our, as I had truth about our world, we have every day's mundane operations, and then side up. Side up should be intuitive to, to many people here. It's probably the most important one for any 24-7 service. And it's really dead simple if you think about it. It's just a matter of a service being up, responding reasonably to a, a reasonable user request in a reasonable time frame. A whole bunch of reasonablys in there. That's why we have SLOs. How many of you are familiar with the, the concept of features, quality, schedule, pick two? No? Oh, okay, there, there's some hands. I was worried for a second, I'm like, man, I've been working all the wrong places. So the thing about site up is that without this, you don't actually get to consider the trade-offs between features, quality, and schedule. You're just out of business. It was December 2014. And I, as I said, my team had just begun partnering with an engineer who was responsible for LinkedIn's largest on-prem, black box, um, off-the-shelf solution, whatever verbiage you want to use, or adjectives, rather. Essentially, this was stuff we hadn't bought. I mean, we hadn't built in-house. We'd bought it, and we were using it because we didn't want to make our own bug tracker. We didn't want to make our own uh, you know, source control system. Uh, and our goal originally was simply to go in and understand what's, what is the current lay of the land because these systems had never had SRE support before, and we didn't know where to spend our time. This was really early on in the days of, of tools SRE, and we were try as I, we had we were outnumbered by our, our partner engineering org, forty to one at the time. At its peak, it was sixty to one, by the way. So we were trying to figure out where to have an impact. And the thing is, we didn't even make it through documentation review before we noticed something. The runbooks were fantastic. They covered how to make a repo, how to delete a repo, the fact that you should never delete a repo. Then why do we have to how to delete a repo in here? Uh, they covered how to adjust Jira in various ways. They covered everything you might care about in day-to-day -day administration. But there are two pieces of information that were missing: the disaster recovery plan and the scaling strategy. There was nothing, and disaster recovery is pretty self self-explanatory. But there was no notion of this is the next bottleneck we're going to hit. So this is how we need to be preparing for it so that we don't actually hit it. We can instead scale past whatever the next bottleneck is. And bear in mind, this was at the end of December. And this was, uh, you know, LinkedIn does an office shutdown at the end of December every year. And the whole point is to say, you know, we appreciate all of your hard work. Get out. Go enjoy some part of your life that is not here. Don't care what it is. Don't care what you're doing. You can be working on pet projects, but you can't be here. Go, go de-stress. Go do something else. And, I, and this matters because I caught our partner engineer literally one foot out the door on our old Mountain View campus, door half open, backpack over shoulder, and I asked him, hey, before you go, you know, I can't find anything in your documentation about the DR strategy or the scaling strategy. How are we going to scale SVN for the coming year? I'd like to get a jump on that. Well, and he chuckled, and he turned back and said, well, my, as a, my strategy for it's retirement. And I thought this was pretty funny. And you know, I'm like, but I'm sitting there kind of groaning in my head going, oh, another person who doesn't really want to work with me. As a, how are we, I know, who can imagine? As a, the, uh, you can't just decom source control. It doesn't work that way. We can't just decom it. So I, put a, so I put a meeting on the calendar for January, as any good, good people managers want to do. And as I figured we get everyone in a room, and we continue the conversation then, and we finally get traction on this thing. 
And I went off and you know, packed up my bag, and I enjoyed my vacation too, and I'm really glad I did. Because when I got back, the very first staff meeting, we're, up, we're sitting around the table, and uh, the leader of the staff meeting you know, is starting to talk about how important it is that we plan a team launch. And soon, I'm saying, well, why do we need to plan a team launch? We just got back from, from vacation. You know, it's cool and all, but you know, why is this at the top of the list? Well, it turns out that partner engineer had, in fact, retired. <laughs> and a scaling strategy, it wasn't fucking funny anymore. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with that? So obviously at this point, you know, my head just exploded. I distracted for the rest of the meeting. I didn't even attend the dinner because I was so distracted. Felt bad about that. Rolled up the sleeves, got a couple of engineers, as they along with myself. We, we went to go understand the lay of the land. No longer content with docs. We started tearing through uh, the metrics, the alerting, everything we could, as a, the actual host itself, to figure out how you know SVN first was stood up because SVN housed the source, source code, and those are basically the crown jewels. And then, of course, we didn't find any metrics or alerts, but there were no complaints, so that clearly meant things were fine. So the first thing we did, though, was to prove our success and the fact that there were no problems here, we built uh, something we refer to internally as the observer framework. And it's the implementation of two classical computer science patterns, the observer and the adapter. LinkedIn already has a really robust modern alerting pipeline, so why not use it? So essentially, this thing was just a standalone daemon. We didn't want to touch SVN in any way. We didn't have to because we didn't know for sure that it was safe. But you know, no complaints. So we didn't want to be the cause of any complaints. And over the next 24 hours, you know, it observed and it emitted standard metrics our normal pipeline could consume. And we saw the squiggly lines start showing up on the graphs, and then the alerts themselves started you know, coming to life, the standard alerts we offer. And this was a lot of fun for about eight hours. And at the end of that eight hours, we noticed something that took our sense of excitement and enthusiasm and turned it into, well, something less than that. It turns out SVN at LinkedIn had a bimodal traffic pattern, two peaks. And during each one of those peaks, it was dropping between 18 and 23 percent of all traffic. Yikes. And the reason we weren't getting complaints is because everyone who was angry was dealing with people, as they dealing with the applications one level up the stack. So they were fielding the complaints for us. Obviously not a pretty not a great scaling strategy long term. At this point, we stopped all other projects, as you might imagine. This is a big problem. We rolled up our sleeves. Everything else was set aside. We got to work. The idea was we were going to take an intelligent risk. We were going to invest everything my team had, everything, into stable, as I build an interim solution for SVN that stops the bleeding now and buys us about six months' worth of runway. With that six months, we would then, working, with, yeah, working in collaboration with our partner engineering groups, we were going to build a permanent successor to the current architecture. And the current architecture, by the way, is just a single node, active and passive pair. And this worked pretty well for the next two and a half, three weeks. We ended up getting something called SVN HA, SVN Highly Available, I know, creative name, you know, online pretty quick. And this was a cluster format. So we actually had it was a six-node cluster, five of which were right through proxies. They sat at the front, and their only job was to accept as a serve read traffic and if they got a write, to proxy it back to the read-write master in the back, whose, in turn, only job was to accept writes and then synchronize the changes out to the read proxies. And when the, as a go-live date hit, this thing did amazing. As I, took, as I took the load like a champ and was asking for more, this thing was something like 30% total capacity used during peak. Great. We'd bought ourselves some runway. In fact, the only thing left in the plan to do was to go back and uh, update the DR site and fail over to the DR site and fail back again. And that's really where I wish the story ended. <laughs> but it doesn't. They say time and tide wait for no one. But that's horribly incomplete. It should read time, tide, and side outages and <laughs> wait for no one. And more so, this is probably a perfect chance to invoke Murphy for anyone who believes in Murphy's Law. Because two days, 48 hours, before our brand new disaster recovery site was ready, the unthinkable happened. Primary storage failed on the SVN read write master. It was a Veerdink card, one terabyte, and it failed in such a way that the entire host was non recoverable. So SVN HA could no longer accept writes. No developers at the company could commit code. Deployments didn't work because of a legacy dependency on, on SVN. Um, oh, and our DR strategy was invalid because our DR site was still under construction. 
this is probably the worst possible position you can find yourself in. For the next two days, we fought pretty valiantly to bring SVN back online repo by repo. Some repos were online in, in hours, others were, took the full 48 to bring back. But at the end of that, it was two months since we'd owned SVN. Two months to the day. And at the, so in the two months we'd been responsible for SVN at LinkedIn, we'd inflicted more change on SVN than had occurred in its entire history at LinkedIn. And we'd also had the worst outages in, in, for SVN or source control in general in LinkedIn's history. But you know what the important thing about the story is? The most important thing. We won. Despite the fact that things went wrong and progressively continued going wrong, at the end of two months, we had a stable SVN installation that could scale far past our current needs. We had a DR site that worked, you know, because we had to test it almost immediately. And, you know, and we had documentation. So any new engineer, regardless of team, could go in and go, oh, yeah, you do have a DR plan. That's helpful. So this one admittedly was huge. This one was probably the biggest one I've ever been involved in, the most intense and crushing pressure I've ever seen placed upon at least myself or my team at any company that still exists today. And despite the immense pressure, the team didn't give up. They didn't buckle. Every time something new went wrong on top of everything else that had already gone wrong, we added it to the priority list, and we kept taking one more thing down off the priority list and kept fixing one more thing, and eventually, Beaten, battered, and a little singed, we came out the other side in one piece after having fixed enough of these things. The thing is, in this whole, whole situation though, I don't know how many people, as I caught this during the story, the plan we had had an inherent flaw and it's worth calling out because it was the single greatest mistake that was made in this whole thing and it was mine. I assumed, we'll talk about that later, but I assumed very wrongly that when I committed all of my team's resources to solving this thing that we were responsible for, that I committed all of LinkedIn's available resources to this problem. And when you're in the middle of a firefight, it's really hard to maintain perspective. It's really hard to step back and go, what is it that I'm actually doing right now? What's the value of this instant response effort for the company, or this firefighting effort, or this project? Well, I'll tell you what it was. This is, these were the crown jewels of the company. This, this was the product of thousands of engineers working for more than a decade. And I went at it with six people. If I had thought to take a step back and raise my hand and say, hey, I need help, I wouldn't have gotten any farther than that before an army of engineers, well, figurative army of engineers, was piling through the door to provide whatever help I needed. I mean, this stuff matters. But I didn't. I assumed that we had already committed everything we could possibly commit. And as a result, that, directly, that one assumption directly led to a plan that had a fatal flaw. It required sequencing the primary site build before the DR site build. Not for any technical reason, but we didn't have enough heads to do it. But we didn't have enough people. And that in turn led us into a, about a week long period of which we made it through five days, where if we needed the DR site, it wasn't there. You see, site up is far more than just instant response. Site up is refusing to accept site outages as normal. It's doing your best to prevent site outages. It's learning from your mistakes, sometimes through a blameless postmortem, sometimes not, but doing everything within your power to learn at the end of it. And company, any company should take note of this, regardless of whether you're pre-IPO, you've already IPO'd, uh, you're huge, you're small, it doesn't really matter, because every major outage that you have is one more opportunity for your customers to lose faith in your company. And without your, your customers, does your company still exist? And if so, for how long? And in fact, I'd go even farther. I'd say not being careful to learn from your site up related mistakes is often a bit like playing Russian roulette. You know, in this particular case, my mistake didn't kill me or anyone else. But if I hadn't learned, could anyone in this room really say for sure what would happen next time? Okay, so we've gone through the really heavy ones. We've gone through the, the, the two axioms, every day is Monday operations and side up, that govern the constraints on our world, the state of our world, the fact that we have a pair of incredible demands placed upon us. So let's start talking about how we deal with it, how we get ahead of the curve. This one, what gets measured gets fixed, 
is, is they probably exist in at least half a dozen, if not two dozen or more variants. This particular version you know, was adapted from the phrase produced by Hewlett Packard back, as I had back many years ago. Long before home computers, printers, or even the internet, they were making scientific uh, measurement devices that would be perfectly at home in a lab, and they, they were very good at what they did. And the simple fact behind this one is that if you can measure it, you can understand it, you can discuss it, you can reason about it, and you can act upon it with confidence. But if you can't measure it, not only do you know if you actually fixed the thing, you don't even know if it needed fixing in the first place. Not really. 2015. Yes, we're moving closer to the present day. We know that, say, we were say, getting feedback on our internal tooling from a number of different engineers scattered across different verticals, no teams in common, that all simply that boiled down to a collection of related comments. There's some other stuff too that was a little bit more colorful, but the collection of related comments I'm going to share here was, oh, the tools are a pain. Look, I've home rolled my own internal tooling that's even better. Or, you know, you get the idea. They weren't happy. And they thought the tooling was uh, not where it should be. And of course, as someone affiliated with the internal tooling and, and who takes it rather, you know, rather personally when we don't do as good a job as we can, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know what, what we were doing wrong. Why was the perception of tool suffering? So we, we crafted a very long, as a very detailed internal survey about our tooling. Every single product we offer, how, do you, say, how much do you like it? You know, a little, little one to 10 rating, but also a written response, optional, for anyone who'd willing to, willingly volunteer that. We were trying to make sure this didn't take several hours to finish. It could be finished in about five minutes if you wanted to. But it also included something called a net promoter score or an NPS a single roll-up value from those uh, 1 to 10 scores that would allow us a single number between negative 100 and positive 100 that we could use at large internal conferences, not really intended for this forum, but you know, whatever, we're going to use it here too, um, that simply measures how enthusiastically, or attempts to measure how enthusiastically people like or dislike the thing you're asking about, in this case, the internal tooling. And of course, the results came in. We had, as a we slowly watched the percentages climb. We had 10% participation, 20, 30, 40. We got up above 50%. We were happy because we didn't think 50% would actually take it. And we started tabulating the results. And when the results came in, they hit us like a truck. The NPS was negative 46. I heard a couple grunts. It's worth noting, it's hard to get an extremely positive score, but it's also fairly hard to get an extremely negative score. <laughs> Now, we weren't content, though, just to say that this new survey was completely accurate. This was well outside of what we expected. So what we did was we went back to our existing GCN tracking data. And GCNs are just LinkedIn's way of recording site incidents. And notably, they record MTTD, MTTR, and a lot of other useful stuff so we can go back and learn, even from historical uh, incidents. And this was right around the time when, thankfully, something called the Site Reliability Dashboard was produced internally by the, the formerly NOC, now Site Operations team that allowed us to actually munch this data for the first time in aggregate and slice and dice it however I wanted. So we mined that data to really, hopefully, to validate this new data because it was so outside of what we expected, or alternatively, to disprove it and you know, go back to the drawing board and make a better survey. The good news, if you could call it that, was that after looking at this, not only did it support the new human-powered data source, <laughs> Uh, it showed us that, that those, those rumors probably should have been called understatements. Because, you know, if we lined up every sign incident we'd had relating to the internal tooling end to end over the last 12 month period before I ran these calculations, we would have had at least one kind of outage, sometimes very minor, sometimes bigger, for six months out of the prior 12, continuously. Now, you're probably thinking, holy shit, that's awful. How can, how can you get up on stage and talk about this? Well, the simple fact is, this is you know, I tend to agree with you that it hurt. It felt like I got sucker punched. But at the end of it, it gave me two clear data sources that we could use to back each other up that were self-consistent and, more importantly, told us exactly where we needed to invest to get a, as a potentially quite positive result if we would only do it. So we founded TS3 shortly thereafter on January 2nd. And TS3, by the way, is a very dead simple concept. We gather together every on-call for all of the internal tools teams 
and my own as I, and the SRE teams associated with them into one room for 30 minutes every day, Monday through Friday. And we go over every site incident that occurred in the prior 24 hours or really to the prior TS3 meeting. And when we do this, we go over the MTTD, you know, mean time to detect, MTTR, mean time to resolve. For our site incidents, we go through what happened, why it's not going to ever happen again, you know, what we've done to fix it, or we go over post-mortem action items if there's a deeper level discussion. And we also go over all of the changes, the, to be clear, manual changes we're planning to make for the following day. Automatic changes we don't care too much about. We have other systems for that. But for manual changes, we definitely want peer review. I mean, we peer review our code. Why wouldn't you peer review your manual changes? And when we founded this meeting, we had success criteria that was dead simple. We wanted to reduce user impact. That's it. That was the, that was the total success criteria. And we only measured two things. Again, the MTTD and MTTR. And in doing so, we set up a really powerful incentive structure for engineers of all types and team affiliations to file the GCN as quickly as possibly and as accurately as possibly, and then drive the incident to resolution as quickly as they could without necessarily regard for when users noticed or was there when users started complaining. We specifically rejected the notion of counting the total quantity of site outages or GCNs or a, the total quantity of a specific priority or specific severity of a site outage. Because if we counted those, we were afraid that we would actually encourage people to try and fix the problem before the users noticed, thereby avoiding the whole GCN or the whole site outage being recorded. I mean, that would technically be success per the written requirements. But as many of you in the room probably know, if you know there's an outage, your users probably already know as well. They just haven't quite picked up the phone yet to call you. You know, I saw a t-shirt pretty recently. Uh, it said, being an engineer is easy. It's like riding a bike. Except the bike's on fire, you're on fire, everything's on fire, and you're in hell. And I looked behind that one on the shelf, and then I saw the same thing with HR business partner, then consultant, and then you know, manager. OK, I get it. It's a copy and paste job. But it pisses me off to no end. It is probably is a great somni, and that's why it resonated. I cannot tell you how mad I left that store. I actually rode home in, in complete silence. It makes me so angry for the same reason that that stupid dog meme makes me angry. And you all probably know the dog meme. It's the, the cartoon dog sitting in the middle of a fire going, everything's fine. There are a lot of engineers, a lot of managers. Scratch that. That's irrelevant. There are a lot of people in this world who, after enough of a beating, will simply accept that chaos is normal, everything's on fire, and that's just the way it has to be. It's a truth of the world. We're not going to make it better, so why try? Just survive. When we measured the problems we had, even though we got, felt like we got run over by a freaking truck, we showed our partners across the company and our own, inter, yeah, our own team members how important the internal tools reliability was. More importantly, by consistently measuring the results of our actions, we were able to affect change. We were able to prove that not only was this not a simple truth about the world, it was actionable, and we were, in fact, acting upon it. And the results were remarkable. By simply measuring something, we took a, this supposed truth about the world where the internal tooling sucks, and we reduced MTTR year over year by 70%. And that's just the first year of trying this. How good is it going to be next year and the year after that? As they say, what gets measured gets fixed. Right, enough of that venting. Let's get on to something much more constructive and happy. You're only as good as your lieutenants. It doesn't matter if you're a brand new engineer fresh out of whatever orientation your company has, or if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500. You got 24 hours in a day, just like everyone else in this room. And you can be efficient, you can be inefficient, it doesn't matter. you still got 24 hours, and that's the biggest impact you're going to have working directly on anything with your hands. And if you want to have an impact that is larger than 24 hours in a day, you have to get a little creative. You can scale linearly on one end of things through the automation of your work one more thing at a time, never having to go back to do that, and that's great. You can break past the 24-hour boundary that way. Alternatively, if you want to scale exponentially, you can inspire others to work together towards a shared objective. 
Perhaps they themselves either inspiring others or automating their work as they go. And perhaps there's some combination of everyone doing everything. But that latter, by the way, is the definition of leadership and the way in, is a one way in which you can stay ahead of the curve in a world where every day is Monday in operations. But simply, when the rate of change climbs too high for you and, and climbs too high for the best engineer you know, you need a team. You can't go it alone. Okay. You don't have to raise your hands on this one if you don't want to. How many of you have seen the best engineer or a great engineer or an engineer you hugely respected make the switch to people manager? Okay. How many of you have seen an engineer do this and they be an awful people manager? Okay, same hands went up. That's great. The, uh, well, it's actually pretty bad now that I think about it. <laughs> So here's the thing, intuitively I know this to be true because I was that great engineer and then I was that awful people manager and assuming that no one in the audience is from my team and can refute me on this, I'm not a pretty damn good people manager. Good silence. <laughs> so my first job when I made the switch from, uh, from individual contributor to people manager was to actually build out the tools S3 team for LinkedIn. And I was confident I understood the challenge ahead of me. The challenge was pretty straightforward. We had a team that predated us by years. We had hundreds of applications that needed support in various sizes and, and shapes. We had, of course, operational problems from those pre-existing ones. We had new applications being built. So really, it seemed like all we had to do was make sure we cut off the supply of new stuff that was getting out the door without our influence and uh, make sure we were in the right meetings and everything would work out. Yeah. I tackled this with the same strategy I used on all my prior technical successes. We divided up the technical work amongst everyone. We got to work. And this worked great for about a week. And, you know, of course, me being me, a little less mature at the time, I was the face of the firefight. I was the one leading the way as the whole team charged in to save the day on our new stuff. I was the one sitting back in those administrative meetings going, all right, this is what we need to do for the team. I'm pretty sure it didn't look anything like that. And I, as I, at the same time, I was as I, the technical... Uh, gatekeeper. I was the high bar for craftsmanship on the team, or so I thought. And so all the final project decisions routed through me so that I could, you know, make sure everything had the, as I was, was up to par. Now, as everyone out here, every, most people in the room are probably getting pissed off at me already at this point, because I would be pissed off at me. In essence, we had four people on the team when we started, and we had a throughput of less than one and a half engineers worth of work. I was the bottleneck. It was bad. And I remember distinctly, uh, kind of fuming over this because I was caught context switching. I was constantly trying to do one thing while in an administrative meeting. So I'd be trying to tell people how to solve the, the site issue while I was trying to figure out hmm, what should headcount look like next year? And how do we do too much stuff on one person and not doing a good job at any, any of it? And I was mad. I hold myself to a fairly high bar when it comes to actually doing a good job with these things. And say I was mad was an understatement. I wasn't mad at my team members. I was mad at why couldn't I figure out how to make this thing successful? And I remember sitting, as I was sitting out, sounds quaint, but I was sitting underneath the tree. There was a little bit of wind. I was listening to the leaves rustle. And rather than finding it relaxing, I was just pissed off, just thoroughly fuming. I was like, if I just had a team of four me's, this would be so much easier. I wouldn't have to worry about gatekeeping. I wouldn't have to worry about the communication. I could just, I could just trust everyone to do it themselves. It sounds asinine to say it on stage. It was. But throughout this sitting here fuming, I got to thinking, I was like, man, what would a team of four me's look like? I mean, looking awful like me, I guess. But uh, you don't have to laugh at that. That's just awful. The <laughs> man, pity laughs. But what I realized was this team would result in four times my strengths being brought to bear, which were considerable in my mind. But it had a problem. It would also mean that all of my weaknesses, which there were more than my strengths, would be left completely uncovered, and the team probably wouldn't be effective at any of the crap that I was bad at. And then I got to thinking, okay, well, what do I really want then? Because that won't work. And what I came to the conclusion of, I want a team full of engineers, all of which that exceed me at my peak when I was doing you know, technical work all day, every day. I try and remain technical, and I do a reasonably good job at it. But that's, that's kind of a, a lower bar than at my peak in terms of knowing every technology I touched inside and out. So how do I get that? How do I get a set of team members 
that all exceed me. So I came up with something. On Monday, I gathered everyone around. Oh, great. Here's another time he wants to talk to all of us. And I told him I want to try something completely different. We sat down on paper, well, wiki, but we sat down on paper, our team's core values, the mission, the vision, and the purpose, and we established a culture predicated on a single sentence. My job is to help LinkedIn win. That's it. Everything else is a job function that derives from that, but that is the job for everyone, myself included. My job is to help LinkedIn win. Dead simple. After the expectations were set down and we all agreed on it, it made sense, everyone's on the same page, like, okay, next thing. I'm getting out of the business of being the gatekeeper on all this stuff. And I offered every one of the major ideas up for claiming by the team. If anyone was willing to step up and say, I will claim this major idea we need to run on, fine, it's yours. You have autonomy. Call me in when you need my help. My specialties are removing roadblocks, helping smooth over differences between teams, helping build bridges. Technical guidance, sure, but call me when you want me for that. I'm not going to play the gatekeeper because it's holding us back. And at first, the going was a little rough. I had to encourage people to take intelligent risks. There were some people that were a little nervous about it. It was like, well, last week you were telling us every change had to route through you, and now you, uh, it seems like a trap. I mean, I would have thought that. And... But over the next six months, something remarkable happened. We went from a team of perfectly capable executors being held back by one person who, who thought their role was somehow special and unique amongst the team. And it turned into a group full of technical leaders who had a high bar for craftsmanship because of their own pride in their work. And they were able to execute far more than what a team of four engineers normally could, at least by my measure and by many others' measure. And the best part is they turned it around on me. Six months down the line, six months, maybe seven months down the line, they turned around and went, you challenged us to do, as I did take over this stuff, and we're bored. We need a bigger challenge. And that's how Tools Us already started getting off the ground and started, as I started its climb to get ahead of this curve here and start digging out, of, out from under four years of technical debt that predated us and started building the relationships we needed to work effectively with our, our developer counterparts. You see, every engineer has a very unique set of starting circumstances, and they're largely irrelevant. That's the good news. Whether you are a tech lead, you're a, say you're a manager, you're a brand new engineer who just aspires to influence their first conversation having just started a company, the sooner you begin consciously investing in your people, whether that be your peers, whether that be your, your team, however you want to divide things up, or whether it just be everyone you come into contact with at your company, the better off you're going to be. Put simply, there will come a point in time when you cannot go it alone successfully anymore because the rate of change will climb too high. The number of external, say, external to your company complaints will rise too high. The expectations will grow too high. Either you'll be too successful and people will demand more and you won't be able to keep up by yourself, or a situation will occur where things go so horribly wrong. Either way, the net result's the same. You need peers, you need a team, you need collaborators. You need people that can share the load, can support you, and that you can support. That's how you build, as I get through some of these really tough spots. Relationships matter. And if you've got them, and you've got a, a bunch of people around you that you can trust and that trust you, you can get through some of these really harrowing situations without a major outage. You can get through some of these situations while reducing MTTR when there is a major outage. And more importantly, you have a chance to get ahead of Monday's problems and start making a meaningful difference that lasts longer than the duration of your site outage. All right, back into something a little bit funnier. I'm assuming, possibly wrongly, that everyone in the room has been burned by an assumption before. Fair assessment? Yeah, okay. I'm, look, that's the last time I'm gonna make you raise your hands, okay? We're almost done. You're almost free. <laughs> There'll be booze out there. It'll be good. Oh, up, okay, upstairs. I told. See, I assumed. Wrong. They, <laughs> I really wish I'd planned that. See, here's the thing. The mechanics behind an assumption don't really change whether or not the assumption results in something as minor as me picking up, you know, decaf when I wanted, you know, high test. It isn't decaf, thank you. Or if it causes 
a single conf that causes uh, all your deployments to start failing over the course of two days. An assumption's an assumption. If you assume that you I say that the person you're talking to has understood the message as you intended to convey it, you've opened the door to human error. And what you thought you communicated might be very different from what they understood, and they are going to do their best to honor what they believe you have asked them to do. A corollary, by the way, is trust but verify. If you've got the data, well, it's hard to have assumptions when the data says otherwise. So this one's the story <laughs> about how I moved to the Valley. I moved out here for work. I actually moved here five years ago to join LinkedIn. And I was over the moon. I was ecstatic. I was getting, I, I received an invitation to join the as I, the, the engineers in Silicon Valley to work on some of the hardest problems facing the world, to do some good while I was at it. Over the moon happy. I mean, I mean, what can you say? This is the sort of stuff that your professors way back when at university or your, your, the people you've looked up to reference from time to time. This, for me, this was mind-blowing opportunity. And it was, I mean, how can you not be swept up in the allure of it all? And I got out here, my first week I was sitting in DS3, the Daily Site Status Stand-Up. Yes, in fact, that is the meeting that inspired TS3 in a prior story. And we sat down in the operational meeting. It was, I believe it was a Tuesday, maybe a Wednesday morning. It's been a while. Not really important whether it was Tuesday or Wednesday, because it was Monday anyway. But I was so thoroughly impressed by the brilliant minds sitting around me. People with 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, someone with 40 years of experience in operations. And it showed that... They were discussing problems driving to the scale that I couldn't have previously imagined. It was amazing. The meeting was called to order. We started route, as I, as I bouncing through each of them, uh, each of the GCNs, each of the site outages we had in the last 24 hours. And one by one, the engineers rattled off one at a time. This is what happened. This is how we fixed it. This is why it will never occur again. This influenced MTTD. This influenced MTTR. Well-oiled machine. And I'm sitting here going, oh, man, I might have made a big mistake. I don't know if I'm ever going to fit in out here. I mean, these guys, these engineers, they're, I don't know if I can keep up. And then we had a GCN that was a little different. This GCN simply said, LinkedIn.com is throttling. No details. And over the next couple of minutes, the conversation devolved rather quickly into engineers theorizing about what was causing it and then defining and redefining the term throttling, which, by the way, is also new to me because I'd never heard it before in relation to a website. I'd heard it plenty of times in terms of cars, and I'd heard it in terms of, you know, I thought it might be rate limiting, but, you know, again, new term. And over the next conversation, I gathered the following facts that kind of inform me. Throttling, in this case, meant we were dropping some percentage of user traffic on the floor to preserve the integrity of the rest. Pretty shitty experience if you're in the unlucky percentile. Two, all the front ends had this thing in common, so the common networking gear in front of all of it was suspected. That common networking gear had no errors we could find, and as I was operating fine, had no capacity problems. And the, the leader of the meeting stopped everyone and led in with something. It said something very unusual. It stuck with me. He said, and I'm trying to quote this accurately, I'm a product of public education. Use short words and short sentences. The room goes silent. You could hear almost the collective breath as people began to resume their heated debates on the technical merits of theory one versus two, and then he cut them all off with and continued. I'm going to ask simple questions, and eventually I will find cause. I thought this was kind of weird. I was like, you know, we just disrupted a formerly well-oiled machine now. And so he let in. Okay. We have no capacity problems, correct? Yes. This is an older data center, mind you. There's four gigabits in the front door. Is that right? Yes. Okay, is that four one gig links or is that one four gig link? Well, it's four one gig links. Okay, and you're sure there's no capacity problems? Yes. What's the capacity on each of the four one gig links? In that moment, I realized that I actually could fit in because I can make mistake as I mistakes like I'm assuming they're making all the time. This is going to be great. Some typing. Missing metrics, of course. And it was one of the four gig links is penned at one gigabit a second is dropping traffic. <laughs> Solved. In this particular case, we did not have the data we needed 
we assumed, again wrongly, that the aggregate data for these four one gig links told us an accurate enough state of the world that we would never need the specific metrics for each one gig link. After all, why would they be configured differently than each other? That's absurd. When does that happen? Obviously, we later updated the metrics so that we had the same detailed data around the four one, is it the, the aggregate that we did? Is it, we updated the metrics for each of the four one gig links so they matched the, the aggregate data. Great. The thing is, we're human though. We make assumptions. It's how we reason about the world. This is how you make mental shorthand. This is fine. And this taught me two things one that turned out not to be very valuable, and one that was very valuable. The not valuable thing was don't assume anything. You're going to make assumptions. The really valuable thing it taught me was find the assumptions that are in your current conversation, that are in your technical designs, and call them out for everyone to see. Ask the simple, painfully obvious question, because if it really is simple and painfully obvious, and the answer is well understood, it's, also, it's very cheap to answer. But if you ask that question and you get a bunch of blank stares, you might have just overturned an assumption and saved everyone in the conversation a tremendous amount of time. Right. So I said there were 10 axioms. I said it in the description, I said it you know, at the start of this, and I said it just now. But the thing is, I wouldn't be able to do justice to all 10 if I tried to work through them today. It just, we, we wouldn't make it. I'd have to have some really short stories, and it'd really just be not fun for me. And I imagine it'd be even worse for you all. But there are two axioms that describe the state of the world in which we, we live, and that's every day's mundane operations and side up. The need to support that ever accelerating software development cycle, change is constant, and the need to you know, keep the site up. I can't reiterate that enough. The other eight deal with how we, well, how we overcome those challenges, how we get ahead of the curve. So these five were chosen because they help as I, they can be used out of the box to help accelerate a fledgling SRE team, its development, or they can use, be used without needing to know the history of an established SRE team to greatly strengthen the culture. But if you'd like to learn more, go to everydaysmundaneoperations.com. I've talked about less than 25% of the published stories we have. And if you'd like to see the world through David Henke's eyes, yeah, my partner in crime on this one, that's where you can do it. So again, about the world. You cannot stop change, because if you stop change, your company will die through a slow obsolescence. Likewise, you can't leave the site down, because every time the site does go down, you risk breaking the delicate trust, and sometimes fickle trust, that your customers have placed in your company, you know, your continued employment. So to make forward progress despite that all, you have to understand where the problems are through careful measurements. You have to develop empowered and capable you know, peers, partners, team members, colleagues, what have you, that can support you and that you can support through the worst of times and can celebrate in the best of times because, frankly, you'll have both. And you can't assume anything. You can't assume you know the path forward because times are changing. There's always something new to know. There's always some previous assumption that used to be valid that becomes invalid. If you're able to do all of this, you're not only going to survive, but you're going to thrive in this wonderful world we share where every day is Monday in operations. Thank you.